I want to introduce somebody very special tonight, and um, uh, it's just great. It's been a tough week with the baby and all the things, and uh, this, when we know there's going to be a lot of spiritual breakthrough, that's um, when we also receive some opposition. But Simone, thank you for flying down, or do you fly up? What do you say from Joburg? Up. You fly up there, you fly down here. Yeah, you're down to the promised land. Yes, okay. But this is the promised land. Uh, Simone has been in church here just, uh, just a couple of months ago. We're not going to say how many. Um, but it's just great that you are a testimony to Jesus, there, especially in areas where people are very liberal. They don't have a biblical worldview, and uh, it's, it's challenging. So for those of you who don't know, uh, she played in Seven de Lawn, Ferry Fools, Hotel, Bernal Landers, anything. Yeah, Bernal Landers is inside Landers for all the English people. Okay. And Hotel is Hotel, Seven de Lawn, you know that one. Okay. But so, Laka Laka. So, Simon Day, will you come up as we're going to pray together? Let's just welcome her as she is just passionate. So, Father, we just thank you for this evening. We thank you that we can receive uh, a blessing from you, Father, because it's you that speaks through her. And we just prepare our hearts for your word. Father, we thank you for the effort. And we pray that for her and her family, that you'll bless them, that you'll keep them safe, Lord, that you will protect them. And, Lord, that you will be a light, Lord, into a broken world, Lord, that so desperately needs you, Father. And uh, Lord, come and show yourself tonight to us through her. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. Amen. Thank you. Thank you. <laughs> Thank you so much. Um, hi, everyone. It's amazing to see your faces. Obviously, you've been sitting here. Lauren, I'm see, I watch, I watch you. I see what you're doing. Um, it's, it's an incredibly huge honor to be here. Now, obviously, my slides will be gone. Um, yeah, it's an honor to be here. I, I just realized that it's been more than 10 years that I came to Shofar Stellenbosch for the first time. 2009, I was a first year student, do the math. Um, I never thought I'd get to a place where I'd be like, oh, I'm not going to tell my age. No, I'm turning 32, praise Jesus. I love getting older and wiser. Anyway, I am, yeah, yeah, with wisdom and life experience, we get to know Jesus every year, so I want more. Um, I just want to say that I always stalk this church family, like I follow you guys on Instagram and Facebook, <laughs> and I'm always like cheering you on behind the scenes, yes, Lord, do what you are doing, revival. So um, I'm so proud to be not necessarily a daughter in the house, but I call myself a daughter of the house, and I've been eating from the fruit that you have sown so faithfully, Sias, for the past how many years? So, Danke, I just want to honor you as a father in the house. Thank you for what you've laid down. It's incredible to just come in after so many years and be like, Lord, have the reward of your suffering because of the, the laid down life that this man has. Oh, what can you brought me? Bless you. We love you, Sias. We love you. Danke. Anyway. <clears throat> All right, turn to your neighbor and say, I hope that you are not an introvert. <laughs> yeah, that's so. Those are for my fellow introverts. I know what it feels like, the awkward eye contact, the <laughs> please start talking. I know, I can, I can, I'm feeling you. Anyway, um, so I just quickly want to ask, I know that a few of you have, have raised your hands. Whom of you are family here. You go here, you've been in this church family, you maybe have been here for longer than a year or this past year. Will you raise your hand? Lekker. Come on, hello. Um, whom of you are here for the first time? Just, I want to see. Lekker. Lekker, lekker, lekker. Very cool. I'm not also going to give you ice cream. Um, that's not good for you. And um, whom of you that are here for the first time are first years? Ach. Oh, bless you. Oh, lekker. Sterkte. Um, <laughs> I'm going to go into my story now, guys. First year was rough for me. Oh, I was messy. Um, anyway, so I want you to know that every single person 
you in this seat like God has an assignment and he wants to meet with you tonight. And I know, you know, casually someone said, please come to the service or maybe you saw a poster somewhere or however you got here, I want you to know that your name is written on the seat that you are sitting in. God wants to do business with you tonight and he's serious about you coming here. And I'm, not, I'm saying it because there was so much opposition for me to come here this week. And it's not because I'm special. It's not because you know, whatever the name or whatever. It's literally just because there's aspects of my story that some of you need to hear. Some of you have questions. You have questions with the Lord and God wants to answer it through stuff that has happened in my life. So I want you to know that God really called you by name to be here tonight, to hear certain things. And, um, you know, I'm not one to, to look for the devil behind every bush. I don't know if you know those kinds of people. Maybe you are that kind of person. And it's fine. You're like, oh, Isai, oh, Isai. Again, you eat a donut and you regret it and you say, the devil made me do it. <laughs> and that's, that's fine. I blame shifting a little bit. But um, we, we are not called to look for the devil behind every bush. We are called to fix our eyes on Jesus. He is the reward of our faith. He's the joy set before us. So if the enemy comes and he comes with his fear and his terror and his oppression and his attacks, we don't give him too much attention. Am I right? He doesn't deserve it. He wants attention. When we give it to him, he feeds off of it and he brings more terror and more opposition. Anyway, but that doesn't take away from the fact that there isn't a war for your soul. And there isn't a spiritual realm. We know that, right? The, the battle is not against the flesh. It's against principalities, against powers that rule. Um, and uh, I'm sorry. My mom is through it. Anyway, what I, what I want to get to is that T.D. Jake said, you must understand your enemy um, because you cannot overcome what you do not understand. So... Although we fix our eyes on Jesus, we are aware of the fact that when there is opposition, it's because the enemy feels threatened, right? Um, so what happened this week is my baby girl, her name is Harper. She is nine months old. She's the cutest thing alive. And she fell really ill. Obviously, I'm going to say that. She fell really ill this week. And at the beginning of this week... Um, it's strange. God said to me, you can, expe or you, can, um, you can expect opposition to come this week um, because of what he wants to do tonight. So every time something happened, I wasn't shaken. Like we are not shaken because these things happen because God prepares our hearts beforehand. Um, because we know what the assignment is because we are focused. Anyway, so Harper was admitted to hospital on Friday. And um, I even like packed a bag when we went to the pediatrician because God told me that she was going to be admitted. So I'm walking into the hospital and the doctor is like, I'm afraid that your girl is going to be admitted. I'm like, yes, let's go. She's like, you are a strange mom. <laughs> and I'm like, yeah, so good. Um, but God told me, and you know, and it gives us opportunity to start sharing, to start testifying about why we remain peaceful when storms happen, because that's what Jesus did, right? He, he sat in the storm, he slept in the storm. And so when we become like him, and as we are transformed into his image, we can start sleeping in the storms of life, and we are prepared for it. And so um, regardless of the fact that my daughter was in hospital, um, I was just reminded that in 2006, how many years ago? My math is very bad. Um, I gave God my yes. I said to him, Lord, use me, send me, regardless of what it's going to cost. And there are moments and times in our lives when it's really inconvenient to say yes to God. It's inconvenient to be obedient. But love obeys. And because we are in him and he loved us first, we receive that love. It's easier to obey him. What I really want to get to is that every attack from the enemy is actually an opportunity for us to reframe our minds to see God's goodness behind it, right? So I always get this picture of Jesus on the cross, and I see, I see how the enemy 
you know, he conjured up this plan. Jesus and, and, and the Father and the Holy Spirit, they're sitting in heaven and they're like, okay, guys, so this is the plan. We want to redeem mankind. We want to bring them with us, you know. We want to bring them into eternity. We want to set them free. Jesus, you are going to earth. Jesus is like, yeah. The Father is like, you're awesome. The Holy Spirit is like, yes, we're going to equip people. We're going to set them free. We're going to save them from hell, etc. And Jesus comes to earth and the enemy is threatened. And the enemy, no, okay, excuse me. <laughs> and the enemy is like, okay, well, I'm just gonna, I'm just gonna use people, the very people Jesus came to save, and I'm gonna let them turn on him and murder him, and that's how I'm gonna win. So Jesus goes with the plan. He gives himself over. He completely trusts his father, and he's, he's, you know, he dies on the cross. And the enemy looks at the cross, and he's like, ha, told you, I've won. This is my victory, it's over. And God the Father looks at Jesus on the cross, his eyes filled with tears and he's proud and he's crying and he's just like, yes, it's over. This is the victory, we have won. So God always reframes oppression in a different way. And even in, um, in the life of Joseph, um, you know, Joseph told his brothers after they literally sold him into slavery, human trafficked their own brother, they come to Egypt a few years later, this is obviously just a summary, um, and they ask for food, and Joseph looks at his brothers, and he says to them in Genesis 50 verse 20, as for you, you meant evil against me, but God meant it for good, and that is how good God is. So um, the story that you are about to hear tonight um, really is so that you might be encouraged, um, so that you can see what a good father God is to see how what the enemy meant for evil in my own life is for your good, is for your encouragement, is for your salvation, so that you may know that God is the best behind the scenes worker that you will ever meet in your whole life. Good. Like, turn to someone and say, you look better after hearing that. You needed that. Are oh, you, you guys really commit? <laughs> Great, so my story starts in um, 1989, it's a long time ago. Um, my mother works in the South African Air Force. She just finished um, working for the head of the Air Force, um, it's General Geldenhuis. Um, she never went to study, she just like launched straight into a career as a military woman. Um, she built for herself like an extensive and very impressive career in 12 years time, she's 30 years old. My father just came from the, the war in Angola. He worked in the Panzer Division, and I think the Armour Division or something. And he was just awarded the highest medal of honor for bravery in the Angola war. So these guys, these Owens are like at the top of their game, hot stuff in the military, walking with their uniforms. People are like, hello, hello. And, um, <laughs> and this is how the movie starts, okay? And so they meet and Stuff happens and boops, vops, my mom is pregnant. Okay? Turn to your neighbor and say boops, vops. Okay, no, no. <laughs> don't, don't say that. Don't say that. <laughs> Just remember boops, vops. Um, you, yeah. Anyway, so the problem with boops, vopsing <laughs> sorry, is that. Um, <laughs> When you are a woman in uniform in the South African Air Force, you, <laughs> you are not supposed to be pops, but um, when you fall pregnant outside of wedlock, you are immediately dismissed. So you lose your job, everything is on the line for you. Um, and this is sort of what happened to my mother. She has this career and suddenly there's a little bit of a problem. She can't afford to lose her job, and my father isn't really interested in, in getting married to her, and so they decide to go to an abortion clinic. And so um, they go to an abortion clinic, she goes to an abortion clinic, and the doctor asks her, how did you find out that you were pregnant? And she says, um, she did a blood test to really make sure. <laughs> And the doctor immediately shuts off and he says, I'm sorry, I'm not gonna perform this procedure on you because it's black on white and he was afraid of someone uh, prosecuting him. So 
praise God for his conscience. Um, and my mom makes a plan, and it was still illegal in South Africa, um, abortions, and so she went to a bordering country. She gets to this place, she made an appointment at the clinic, and when she gets to the clinic, after how many hours drive, the receptionist tells her, I'm sorry, um, there's a misunderstanding, I don't find your name in the book, and also, the doctor isn't here, he's like, he's overseas with research or something, but yeah, big misunderstanding, I really apologize, please come back next week Friday, literally, right her name down, it's booked, see you next week Friday afternoon. They go back to South Africa, they go back the next week Friday, when they get their third attempt, the, do uh, the, the clinic is closed down by the police because there was pressure from South Africa, third time, closed door. They come back to South Africa, my mom goes to another clinic because Burmok's a plan and she's very determined. <laughs> She has a very strong will. I don't know where I get it from. Anyway, <laughs> she um, goes to a fourth clinic and the doctor warns her that she's too far pregnant. She's past 12 weeks and there's a health risk for her so she can't have the abortion. Um, four times, four times that the enemy tried to kill, steal and destroy, but God, right? Um, anyway, we're only in the middle of the movie, so stick with me. Um, what does Tinky do next? She only has a tiny bump. No one can see that she's pregnant. And she wears big, loose sweaters in summer to hide it from her authorities. And she puts the baby up for adoption. So she goes through the whole process. She sees a social worker um, on a weekly or monthly sort of basis. And the... Um, you know, the admin is being done, the, the, print, the forms are printed, um, there's another family already ready to receive the baby, the snack. Um, and it's May 1990, and she's about to sign the last documents to give her baby up for adoption. But lo and behold, I'm not kidding, I swear this really is what happened. She goes into labor without signing the documents. Like, Viet, your reaction is exactly what, <laughs> what the movie is asking for. <laughs> she sits like this. <laughs> anyway, yes. <laughs> so she goes into labor. She's rushed to the hospital. It's four weeks too early. The doctor that's supposed to catch the baby isn't there. He's also overseas. Very cheap plane tickets in 1990. <laughs> and the gynecologist that catches me doesn't know that I'm an adoption baby. So instead of taking me out of the room, which is what you're supposed to do when the baby is up for adoption, he puts me on my mother's chest. Last thing that you are ever supposed to do after a woman is in labor. <laughs> anyway, so many moms will tell you, my baby was the most beautiful thing I have ever seen. And I can really tell you they are not. They really are not. Um, I am in no way deceived. Harper was purple and she had a cone head. There was, <laughs> really, there was nothing lovely about her. <laughs> she, um, Andres had a bit of a fright. He was like, whoa. <laughs> um, she looked like a purple Smurfy. She was, but to me, she was the most beautiful thing. Harper, my love, if you are watching this one day, <laughs> there's deliverance for you. Anyway. Um, <laughs> So, for me, after 18 hours of labor, this ugly little thing is the joy that is set before me. I think she's the most beautiful thing that I've ever seen in my entire life, although she looks like Schmeagel. But, and this is exactly what happened to my mother. I was put on her chest, and she locked eyes with me, and she said, I barely even cried. And I think, you know, Babies in the womb might not be fully developed, but their spirits are fully developed. And, you know, in going through inner healing with the Lord, the Lord showed me that at the moment when I was put on my mother's chest, I already expected rejection. I already expected abandonment, you know, because your spirit is alive and fully well, knows exactly what's going on, knows exactly what, what is to be experienced through what your mother is experiencing. And so I just sort of like lock eyes with her. And in that moment, my mother's heart melts. God turns her heart and she decides, I'm going to keep this baby. In a moment, in an instant, my mom decides to be obedient. And um, what happened later is that 
my mom became the first woman after a disciplinary hearing um, that could keep her child and her work. She kept her job. She was the first woman in the South African Air Force to not have to give away her child to be able to keep her position. And after that, they changed leg legislation so that women didn't have to go and abort their children or give their children away when boop spots happened. <laughs> so praise God for the victory that happened on the 18th of May, 1919. That's Jesus. Anyway, so what the enemy mean, means for harm, God uses for good, right? Great story, happy ending, but very difficult to stomach for a 14-year-old with incredibly deep roots of rejection. So I find out when I'm 14 years old, sort of like accidentally, um, and my entire life just falls apart. I'm completely shattered. The rug is pulled out from under me. And I think what happened is that I entered the world with rejection-colored glasses on my face. So everything I took in, all of the information that I took in, even from a child, I was looking for validation for the rejection that I was already experiencing, you know? So... Um, I, had, I grew up sort of in semi-normal circumstances. My mom was a, was a single mom eventually, and, but there were opportunities and God was really good and you can look at the glass half empty or half full, but I always saw it as half empty because of rejection, because of the spirit of rejection. So every single waking moment, my mind was looking for evidence to confirm the lie that I was believing that I was unworthy and unwanted. And um, that's what a stronghold is, right? Whom of you know what a stronghold is? It's, a, it's, a, it's a, a word we throw around very easily, like we pull down strongholds, yeah, we do the strongholds, yeah, this is a stronghold. I never knew what a stronghold was. I was always saying, yeah, stronghold, never knew what it was. Um, so a stronghold is like a fortress, okay? It's the lie you believe that sits in the middle of your mind, almost like, like a castle. And there are walls and fortification and layers that you start building. You know when you meet someone and, and people are like, yes, yeah, she has very high walls. That is because the walls are protecting a fortress, a uh, um, stronghold. Anyway, um, so if you believe at the core of who you are that you are unwanted and unworthy, you'll go through life and your heart will continuously seek information um, that proves the lie. So whenever someone told me, Simona, you are worthy, you are loved, I would never, it would never sit here. It would go here and flutter away because it could never penetrate through the walls and through the fortification that was created around <laughs> continuously like the stronghold. Um, but you cannot behave from a lie. You cannot produce good fruit if what you believe about yourself is a lie, right? Good fruit and good behavior comes from believing that you are loved in Jesus, that Jesus paid the sins, paid the price for your sins, and that you are now accepted, fully accepted in the house of God without having to perform, without having to strive, without having to do anything to understand that I am a human be being and not a human doing. So... The fortresses in our mind determine how we are going to behave. So we look at people and we're like, oh, this person did this, this person did that, without asking the Holy Spirit, Lord, what is the stronghold in their mind? What are they believing about themselves that is leading to this behavior? I can promise you that God is going to give you way more compassion for people when you start asking him, Lord, reveal the lies that this person is believing about himself. And when we start tackling that, I can promise you that be good behavior, better behavior, God-glorifying behavior, will flow from that place. Anyway, so the only thing, so what happened, sorry, this is what I wanted to get to. I was 14 years old. Um, I saw the world through rejection. Everything told me, you are rejected. People would be nice to me, or, and all I would see is the one person that looked at me like this, because they were having a bad day, not because I'm a bad person. So that's how you sort of take in the world, and it just led to incredibly destructive behavior. I am, um, I... It led to depression. Um, it led to attempted suicide when I was 15 years old. Um, I continuously entered dating relationships because I wanted attention from, from a male. I just wanted to feel like I am loved and I am wanted. So I never went into a friendship with a guy. I was always like, what can I get from this that would validate my need to feel wanted? Um, it became very destructive, it led to a lot of compromise, and I was just <laughs> a complete and utter mess. 
And um, what happens is that when we start believing the word of God, the word of God is the only thing that can penetrate through those walls. So you can be a Christian all your life, but if you don't know the word of God, it's not going to transform you. Nothing can, self-love and psychology and dead talks will never be able to attack the stronghold and the lie in your mind. It's the word of God that pierces, that's living and alive, and it's able to pull down that stronghold. So this starts with repentance. It starts with salvation. That's, that's where it starts. You are either here or you are over the threshold of salvation, and then God starts to walk a road with you in terms of restoration. But um, how did this happen for me, right? Um, how did I get saved? That's, that's where it happened for me. Um, when I was 16 years old, I went on a church camp. Um, Who of you are from Gauteng? Gauteng Aleng, lekker. Um, so I went on a Winkelspreit camp, um, I went because there was someone there whom I liked. <laughs> Big surprise. <laughs> Wanted a bit of attention. Um, oh, God was so kind. Anyway, so I went on this camp, and he, this guy, gave his attention to another girl. <laughs> My heart was absolutely shattered. <laughs> and, um, and God was like, well, maybe now I have your attention. So 2006, and Retief Berger was leading the worship, and we were singing... Um, uh, who knows that song? Ah, oh, lots of millennials in the house. Um, anyway, so we were singing that, and they tied a piece of rope from the one corner of the room into the next, one big rope, and they gave all of us little pieces of rope. And they said to us that the small piece of rope, um, this, is, this is a symbol of your life, right? And if you are ready... Um, you know, tie your small piece of rope to the bigger rope because this is Jesus and we can't do anything apart from him. Like he's the vine and we are the branches. And I remember my friends were happily tying their little ropes to the big rope and eventually everyone went out and drank some hot chocolate and coffee and whatever. And I just knew, I just felt that God wanted to do business with me. Like this was a very serious moment. And um, I was so angry and I was so bitter and my life was just such an utter, complete mess. I, was in, I, I really was in survival mode. I woke up every morning just trying to get through the day. And I remember, what, you know, I said to the Lord, in my, in, in my ignorance, I didn't even know Jesus really. I, I met, you know, I saw him in church. We went to the Enge Kerk and I knew about Jesus through the children's books and stuff. And I, I do recall having felt his presence during certain times in my life because he's always off to your heart. From the moment you breathe, God is off to your heart vigorously, vigorously pursuing you, trying to corner you. Please receive my love. Please accept my son. Please receive my love. Please receive my freedom. I love you. I love you. I want you. And God was hunting me down. And in that moment, I felt the love of God fill me up. And I just started sobbing. My, my hardened heart softened. And I fell to my knees sobbing. Because for the first time in my life, this little performer and striver felt completely seen. Nothing I did, like there was no pretense. The walls just came crashing down. And I felt the God of the universe looking right at me, looking into the dark places of my heart and saying, I love you and I accept you and I wanted you and I fought for you. And nothing else in my life could ever give me that validation. No man not even, you know, my mother that eventually like laid down her life for me. Nothing, no, no with my seat title or eerste span netball or anything, A grades or feeling loved or being popular in school or anything, nothing, nothing could satisfy me. Like the taste I have of God's love that evening. And I remember Jesus said to me three things and it stuck with me my entire life. The first thing he said to me was, who told you that you are unwanted? Who told you that I don't want you? Who told you that you are not chosen? I chose you before you could choose me. I've loved you before you can love me back, before you can do anything for me, I love you. Um, and any thought in your head that says that you are unwanted doesn't come from me. And Ephesians 4 says, for he chose us in him before the foundation of the world to be holy and blameless in his presence. In love, he predestined us to become sons. In love, he decided before the creation of the world that you are going to be his son or his daughter. 
That's how much he loves you. Before you were even a thought, God said, I am now determining in my love that I want her. She's going to be mine. Um, Second thing he said to me was, I have a plan for your life. Because that was my big question. I was like, well, if you did intervene four times, five times, what is your plan for my life? Because I feel a little lost. I feel like, I don't really know. I feel like a wave tossed to and fro. I don't know who I am. I don't know what my purpose is. I don't know what you want for my life. And he says, Psalm 139 verse 16, Your eyes saw my unformed substance. You saw my unformed substance. In your book were written, every one of them, the days that were formed for me, when as yet there were none of them. 1 Corinthians 2 verse 9 says, what no eye has seen. Okay. Um, No, sir. Donkey. 1 Corinthians 2 verse 9 says, What no eye has seen, um, nor ear heard, nor the heart of man imagined what God has prepared for those who love him. And Jeremiah 29 verse 11, and we all know it, and we all quote it whenever we go into an exam. I know the plans I have for you, says the Lord. <laughs> because every time I go to an audition, I know the plans I have for you, says the Lord. Plans to give you hope and a future and a role. Thank you, Jesus. No, I'm kidding. I'm kidding. And thirdly, and I think this is really important, God said to me, I can only set free whom you are willing to forgive. And I can only set you free to the rate or to the extent that you are willing to forgive and let go of your bitterness. We miss that. Bill Johnson once said that the three things that torment Christians the most or the things that keep us in bondage the most, one is... um, sins of the flesh, like lust and and pornography and adultery. The second one is substance abuse, like dwellums and and (laughs) dwellums. And the third thing is unforgiveness. So when we are stuck in unforgiveness and we harbor bitterness in our hearts, we completely open the door for the enemy to be rampant in our lives. He can enter into your house and he can do whatever he wants to because we are holding on to something that we feel entitled to, bitterness, right? And I remember one day, oh, well, this specific time God said to me, you have to forgive your parents. Sorry, that is what his, his task for me was. I need you to forgive your parents and to give them the benefit of the doubt. What does the benefit of the doubt mean? Glad you asked. (laughs) Um, God showed me a picture of Jesus on the cross. And when Jesus was on the cross for our sins, he looked at us and he, it's almost like he said to the Father, Lord, I understand, Father. I have been with them. I have seen what goes on. I understand. I have become like one of them. I know, Lord, that they do not know what they are doing. Forgive them, Father. Because if they knew, if they knew that I was the Son of God, if they knew that I was to set them free, if they knew what they had in me, in their presence, they would not have done this. That is what, be, what the benefit of the doubt means. So that means that we take our offense, we take our bitterness, and we take our unforgiveness, and we look at people who have hurt us. And I looked at my parents, and I had to get to a place where I was like, Lord, okay, if they had known the blessing that comes with children, if they had known how they would have delighted in me as a child, because I am a blessing to my parents, you are a blessing to your parents, you are a blessing to God, God delights in you. If my parents knew the blessing of having me as a child, they would not have done that. If my mother knew the provision that would have come, the doors that God would have opened for, the favor on her life because she walked in obedience, she would not have chosen to take the abortion route. If your father knows, if he knew who he was, he wouldn't have abandoned you. He wouldn't have walked out on you. He wouldn't have... I don't know, had an affair. Whatever has happened in your life, the bully that that spoke stuff over you when you were a child, if they had known who they were, they would not have done it. And therefore, Lord, I release them. And so through forgiveness, we are also set free. Those were the three things Jesus said to me. So that was the first part, right? That was the 180 degree turnaround for me in 2006. But whom of you know that Jesus didn't only die for you to go to heaven with him, right? Like the gospel doesn't stop at the grave. 
Jesus rose from the grave. I'm so passionate about this. Like Jesus rose for you to walk in fullness of life. The, like in John 10, verse 10, he says, the enemy came to steal, kill, and destroy, but I came that they may have life and have it abundantly, that they may walk in fullness. Jesus didn't say, I came so that they can be with us forever and ever and amen. That's not what he said. He said, I came so that they may have life in abundance. Abundance means that it's flowing over. So you waking up every morning in survival mode, constantly being afraid, constantly trying to control, constantly checking who is better than me, jealousy, comparison, all of the stuff, there's no provision, I don't trust God, that is not abundance. Joy and peace in any circumstances, steadfastness is abundance, fullness of life. And so what the enemy does is he keeps you at the door of salvation. First, he keeps you from salvation. And then you give your life to Jesus and he's like, oh, okay, you know what? I'm just gonna keep her from having an abundant life. I'm just gonna keep her from walking in fullness. So what he does is he uses the orphan spirit to keep you in bondage. And I love that Sias was, um, was saying it in his prayer before we started, because I'm like, oh, it's just God speaking. But Romans 8 verse 15 is like my favorite verse in the Bible. Every time someone reads it, I'm like, yeah, I'm not going to be weird. But I really love this verse, Lord. It says, for all who are led by the Spirit of God are sons of God. For you did not receive a spirit um, of slavery that returns you to fear. Fear is not your portion. Fear is not your inheritance. We are not okay with fear, okay? Any fear in your life, God is not okay with it because it keeps you from walking in fullness of life. Anyway, and if we are children, oh no, 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 to fear, but you receive the spirit of sonship by whom we cry, Abba, Father. The spirit himself testifies with our spirit that we are God's children. And if we are children, then we are heirs, heirs of God and co-heirs with Christ. If indeed we suffer with him, that's important, but that's another sermon, so that we may also be glorified with him. I consider that our present sufferings are not comparable to the glory that will be revealed in us, and this part gets me. Creation waits in eager expectation for the revelation of the sons of God. Do you know that creation, creation, the trees, the sea, everything, creation waits with eager expectation. It groans for you to be revealed as a son and daughter in the house. It waits for you to walk out of bondage, to start walking in freedom, to be revealed so that creation may be set free when you walk in your purpose, in identity, in knowing, Lord, this is who I am in you. I'm a daughter. I'm a son. So, what happens is through Jesus, as we walk with him, we don't stop at the door of Jesus. He opens the door to the Father, right? Jesus came to reveal the Father. And I know that sometimes when we hear the word Father, it's so weighty. It's filled, it, it triggers something in our hearts, doesn't it? So some of you came from houses where your father was there and he was semi-perfect. No father is perfect. But I think 80% of society comes from a house where the father is either not really present or they are stuff, you know? So I don't know what the word father brings up in you. Does it bring up punishment, a critical spirit, abuse, maybe emotionally, physical abo abuse, addiction? Does it bring up emotional absence? Um, whatever your ideas of God is most likely shaped by the father or the lack of a father that you had in your life. And Jesus shows us the true nature of God the Father. And did you know that God is kind? He's really fun. Like God the Father is full of joy. Do you know how that like, did it my brain gepreek that God laughs? Oh my word. I was blown away. I could not believe that God had a sense of humor. That God the Father, enjoy, like he's playful. Because I was always so critical of myself. I always felt like I had to work for him. And God can't laugh. And God, you know, he's serious. But God is kind. And, um, and he's trustworthy. And if you struggle to trust God, it's most likely because you struggle to trust your own father figure. Anyway, 
Um, there's so much to unpack when it comes to identity and, and when it comes to sonship versus the orphan spirit, so much. But I'm trusting that as you maybe come to this church and you slot into a community of believers, that God will start unpacking this in your life. I got saved in 2006. I came to Shofar in 2009. And there were like so many things of God the Father that God started revealing to me through this church. I remember I didn't want to come to church anymore because I cried too much. It was rather embarrassing. I really, like, God did such a deep work in my heart. I was literally like, please, please don't preach on God the Father. I can't hear me any. But, but that's how God is faithful to, to bring you through this and reveal more and more and more of himself. So um, I want to just quickly share before we go into ministry what an orphan spirit looks like. And maybe, maybe you have been a son or a daughter in the house. You know, you have given your heart to Jesus maybe a long time ago, maybe last year, maybe last week, maybe this morning, maybe you haven't. But the fact remains that there's always parts of an orphan spirit that God wants to come and come and reveal and heal because he wants to set you free. So an orphan spirit doesn't believe in God's provision or abundance. There's only so much. And if someone else receives something, it means that there's less for me. So this creates jealousy and comparison and ultimately strife. So, so Andy Bird once said, everyone is a hero who is at rest in him. I'm at rest in my identity with God, so everyone I look at is a hero. I can encourage people, I can affirm them, I can celebrate in their successes because I'm at rest in my identity. Second thing, he believes that he or she has to work for God's approval. I'm just gonna quickly go through them. You do things out of obligation because you are scared. You believe in punishment. You constantly believe that God is gonna punish you. Something happens in your life and you're like, God is punishing me. You work for accomplishments and accolades. Your identity is in what you do and not in who you are. Um, maybe you feel like you only got recognized in your home when you performed and achieved, so that is what you feel like you have to do in God's house as well. Um, you can't operate in joy. You are continuously a product, of your uh, a, you're a product of your circumstances or a victim of your circumstances. Um, someone is mislooked towards me, so I'm also going to be mislooked towards them. I can't separate myself from people's behavior. I am continuously a product of how people behave towards me. Um, I need to control. That's another sermon. Um, <laughs> there's shame. I'm afraid to show up and be seen. I'm afraid to take my place in God's house. You believe that Jesus died on a cross for your sins, but that is where he stops. You know, his blood covers everything except my faults and my weaknesses and these things. So I hide. I don't serve in God's house. I don't show up. I don't come forward to pray for people because I'm ashamed. I can so relate to that one. For years I was in this church. I've been saved. God was working through me, oh, in me. But I used to sit in the fourth row and when people would come up for prayer, I would just sit there and think, God can't use me because this and this and this. It's a religious spirit and it's going to keep you in bondage. Okay? God uses anyone. You give him your yes, he's going to use you as an instrument. You can stand in front. People can come to you for prayer. You can say, be sung. But if the anointing rests on you, there's going to be freedom. <laughs> Fruit of the spirit. No? <laughs> and this is where the us versus them mentality comes in. And that's the last bit of the orphan spirit. I spoke to Lauren about this earlier today. But it's basically, you know the story of the prodigal son, right? There's the lost son, the younger brother, that spent his inheritance and he was lost. And then there's the older brother. And what the older brother does is he's full of entitlement. He's in the father's house, but he doesn't act like a son. He acts like God is his master, not that God is his father. So when the younger brother returns, he can't celebrate with his father because he's, he's um, entitled and he's bitter. He's like, why, this, this one didn't do anything. I've been working all this time, I didn't get anything. And God's like, you have everything. <laughs> But the older brother is so stuck in religion. He's so stuck in working for God that he has stopped enjoying the father. And so instead of going out to save the younger brother, which is actually his mandate as an older brother, he stays in the house, bitter, looks after the cattle, does whatever he wants. But he doesn't go out to the younger brother. Jesus is the perfect older brother. He goes out to the younger brother. So maybe you've been in this house and you're the older brother. And you don't go, your heart isn't for the lost anymore. And that is an orphan spirit, actually. So anyway, I know you said I had three minutes. but I'm gonna... So, last thing I want to do. A few weeks ago, the Lord um, woke me up 
And if I wake up at 5 a.m., it's really like by the power of the Holy Spirit. It's not me. <laughs> I'm not a morning person. And I wake up with the song stuck in my head. I'm like, okay, cool, cool, cool. I, take, I go downstairs, I make my coffee, I open the word, and I'm like, yes, Lord, speak to me. And the song is in my mind. I'm like, I rebuke you in the name of Jesus. What are you saying in the Psalms, Lord? And the song keeps on playing, keeps on playing. And eventually I'm like, is it you? Are you? What? Come on. And he's like, yes, please go to YouTube and listen to the song. Anyway, so a clip catches my eye, I watch it. And as I'm watching this, God just like downloads this thing to me and he shows me, he like opens my eyes to see what he's say, say, saying. And I just, I start sobbing and I realize that this is a picture of the church. Um, you know, we sometimes get stuck in cycles of rejection, believing lies of unworthiness, merely waking up in the mornings to survive, never showing up, never daring to go out. We just go through the motions, right? We stop at the door of salvation, like I've said, but we never enter into identity. So we remain orphans. And um, we become complacent. We become familiar with the things of God. And so I'm going to show you the clip. No. Nee. Okay. And before we watch, no, 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 cool. Okay. Before we watch, I want you to take note of two special moments in this. Um, the first is when Kiala, the woman that sings, um, she steps out from behind the stand. So she's standing here and she's singing. And there's a moment where she, it's, it really is a holy moment. She steps out from, from this thing and she just like comes alive. She comes alive. I, I watched and I'm like, Lord, this is you. This is not like we can't conjure those moments. She, she comes in front of the stand and suddenly as she becomes alive, everyone in the room becomes alive. And then there's also a moment when she takes you, Jackman's hand. I wish it was me. But um, yeah, you can show the clip and then the band can, can come up whilst it's showing. Benj and Justin have just written this new song called This Is Me. And uh, we knew that it was going to be the anthem of the film, um, but no one had heard it before. And no one had heard Kiala sing it live. And Kiala, who I didn't even want to come out from behind the music stand. I didn't. I, I kept saying to her, just step out because this is your moment and you have to step out into the ring, metaphorically, because that's what you're doing and you got to stand right there in front of everyone and just belt this out. And I didn't want to. In fact, I stood behind that music stand yeah. until the day of that presentation. There was a moment in the song that I actually was so scared that I had to actually grab Hugh's hand so that I had somebody to hold on to. And then we got to the end of the number and all I remember is just deafening, deafening applause. It was a sort of otherworldly experience. It was one of those moments that will stay with me the rest of my life. Unfortunately, we filmed it. So I'm sitting and I'm looking at this thing and everything in me starts vibrating as I feel God say, I want you to come alive like that. I want my church. I want my church to come alive like that. I'm not okay with complacency. I'm not okay with you sitting in your fear. I'm not okay with the orphan spirit ruling your life anymore. I want to take you into freedom. I want you to step out before the stand and come alive and show up and say, Lord, here I am. I am imperfect, but this make me alive because I can't make myself alive. And you know, she said it was an otherworldly experience. It's only Jesus that can make us come alive like that. And I don't know if you noticed, but you did because I told you to notice. But she took you, Jackman's hand in that moment where she said she almost like, it was so overwhelming for her and she got scared and she just, she took his hand because she needed that support. And I, you know, I can't offer you, you Jackman, but I can offer you this church. I can offer you this family. I can offer you community and I can highly recommend it. 
Because when you step out and you're like, Lord, here I am, I'm throwing myself into the deep end and I want you, Lord, to take my life. And Lord, I'm walking out of complacency. I want to walk into obedience. I want to shake off the shackles of addiction. I want the more, Lord. I want the hunger, Jesus. I want your spirit. It's going to feel lonely at times and you're going to need a hand. And I promise you, it doesn't happen in isolation. And that's how the enemy took me out as a student. I sat here and I was so, I felt so unworthy. I didn't want to be seen. I didn't want to be transparent with anyone. I didn't want anyone to know what a fraud I felt like. Because that's what I felt like every single time I was in God's prayer. I felt like a fraud. You know, I'd raise my hand in church and backslide right into Monday. But I didn't take the hands of those who were stretched out towards me. So many times, invitations, come to the Simone. Simone, can we have coffee? And I would cower away because of fear. And I would call it introversion. It's not introversion. It's shame. It's a spirit of shame. And God wants to deliver you tonight. And God wants to show you people who are surrounding you, giving their hands, offering you the support. And if you are the one offering your hand, I want you to know that God will strengthen you. God will give you wisdom to be able to minister to others. As you lay down your life unto the service of others, God will fill you up. You don't have to be perfect to do that. And so tonight, two things that God really wants to do. In my life, could never, I could never become alive. I could never experience the fullness of God. I would never be able to see myself as a daughter in the house. I'd never be able to really enjoy Jesus if I hadn't given him my yes in 2006. It starts with that. And I don't know what stepping out in front of the stand looks like for you. Maybe tonight it's, Lord, I give you my yes. For the first time in my life, I laid down my intellectualism. I laid down my need to understand the gospel in a theological. I just know that there's a tugging in my heart. Can, can we please stand? I step away from my need to understand because I will trust regardless of the understanding. We make an idol of understanding, right? We want the understanding before we say yes. And God says, will you say yes? And then I bring the understanding. So maybe stepping out tonight for you looks like giving your heart to the Lord for the first time ever. What a big moment. Can I just say that your life will never be the same? It will never be the same. And I know some of you have looked at Christians Donnie's on Facebook, perhaps. And you're like, I don't want that. I don't want to, I don't want to be a sneak. Sometimes the orphan spirit reads out its ugly head. It just does. We are not perfect. And if you are offended with church, I was offended with church. Ugh, I was very offended with church. I almost want to say, if you haven't been offended by church, please raise your hand so we can just beat you and get it out of the way. Okay? Let's just... Let's just go, because everyone is going to go through it. The church is imperfect. And I'm sorry if this is a trigger point for you. I don't want to be disrespectful. But this, if you want a perfect church, I would recommend that you go out the door. You're not going to find it here. What you are going to find is the Spirit of God moving, moving through people, imperfect people, who just want to see people get saved and see people walk in freedom and see Jesus get the reward of his suffering. That's what you are gonna get when you enter this place. I can highly recommend it. But it starts with saying yes to God. So as we close our eyes, and I want believers to pray. You've given your heart to Jesus, whether yesterday I want you to pray right now. And if you, you've come to the place in your life and you're like, Lord, it's a mess. My thought life is a war zone. The strongholds are tearing me down. I'm suicidal. I'm depressed. I'm in toxic relationships. I suffer from rejection every waking moment. I step around the corner and I see people rejecting me. I really, really need a savior. If that is you tonight, will you be so brave as to raise your hand for me? Come on. Thank you, Lord. Thank you. Thank you for your hand. Thank you, I know it's, it's brave. I know it's costing you. I know it's costing you. I know you're standing with friends. 
I know you feel incredibly vulnerable. But can I tell you that the rest of your life with Jesus, which is what's in front of you now, is gonna be full of him asking you, just take one more step. Just take one more step. It's gonna cost you. I know it's gonna cost you, but I promise you the reward is big. The reward is big. It's gonna cost you. Will you take that one step? And now I'm gonna go even further. I'm very arrogant. But I'm gonna ask you if you will come to the front so that we can pray for you. And if you feel afraid and you feel, oh, I feel very seen, I feel very vulnerable, will you ask your friend next to you to come with you to the front? And if you are that friend and you are not sure if the person next to you really knows Jesus, wow, that person really, really has had a chance to give their lives to Jesus, will you put your hand on your friend and say, would you like me to come to the front with you? Sure, God wants to do business tonight. He's very gentle, but you have one opportunity. And I can't go another week knowing that I didn't offer you this opportunity that completely changed my life. Thank you. Donkey. You are so... Come on, come on, give them a hand of applause. Yeah. 